Welcome back to the mountain bike build series. We have the front half of a sick and shreddable mountain bike. And now we're gonna add some of the rear lower tubes, the chain stays, swing, swing, swing. Uh, we're going into battle. We're gonna weld these babies on. It's all ready and fit up and set up. Let's get into it. If you're new to the channel, my name is Joe, and I make tools for bike frame builders, but I also make all these videos, like this mountain bike build series, where I'm, uh, you know, step after step, showing all the steps in, in order to design and build a mountain bike. And so where we left off, uh, I had just mitered the rear end tubes and bent them, and now uh, I did a little bit more work off camera. I drilled vent holes in these dropouts so that the gases from the inside of the chain stays can pass through. I also, uh, I mitered a little bit more off of this to get it where I wanted it. Uh, I drilled a vent hole down here, and then I set it all up in the fixture. So if you're watching earlier in the series, uh, this frame fixture, which was just my homebrew thing I made a couple years ago, it's too short for a long front end mountain bike like this. And so I had to temporarily move this middle section back to do the front end. And then now I slid it back again and I had to get some of this stuff out of the way. But it works. Uh, I just, you know, it's not the best for building a, a long front end mountain bike. So, uh, yeah, I got this fitting up here. And I made this little plate uh, to hold stuff like chain stays to help you with fixturing. And so this was actually kind of tedious, but I got that so that uh, it, it holds this at the right angle and at the right height so that it sits where I want it to. And now I can do some tacks on that. And then the chain stays will sit in here and connect to the dropouts, of course. And so there's a there's an XY coordinate position for the center of this, which is to say that along the X axis, which is like parallel to this beam, uh, I have this dimension here, and that's 351. And then I also have along the Y axis, which is, you know, right here, it's perpendicular to that X axis. Uh, I have, I think, 240 or whatever that number is. And uh, so I set that position there, and then, uh, and then I double-checked it, right? I didn't want to go getting that number wrong, just punch in a number, set it, sure, whatever. So what I did is I did a point-to-point -point measurement in Bike CAD. I went from the center of the dropouts to the top, uh, top corner here. And so I measured it, I think it was like 461 millimeters. No, 462. Anyway... Uh, I put this on here and near as I can eyeball that's 462 and so that checks out you know I triangulated I put this where bike CAD told me it should be it's there and then I measure some other weird random dimension in a different direction and it's like within at least a millimeter I feel confident that I didn't screw up my numbers I didn't enter the wrong number or something it's it's where it should be so you've seen in the earlier clips in the build series how I prep tubing you know I, I want to get a bright shiny finish on the surfaces and then I, you know, I want to make sure everything is deburred so I don't have any like hanging chads or something, right? You don't want to have like the burrs hanging off. Those will just kind of like burn up and make little sparklers into your weld and that's, that's no good. So you want to get nice clean metal. And uh, so I'm just prepping these the same way I prepped everything else earlier in the series. And I figured I'd just do that off camera. It's kind of boring. So I'm about ready to tack this up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get some good heavy tacks on this chainstay yoke. I'll get that on, then I'll get the, the chainstay tubes, those three quarter inch tubes in here. And uh, in order to get those to fit just where I want them, I might need to do a little bit of finessing. So I'm gonna tack this one first, and then uh, after I get all of it tacked, then I can take it out of the fixture and I can actually do all the welding where I'll be able to flip it around and hold it in that bike repair stand like I did in the other video, get really good access to all the different joints. So here I'm just gonna tack this and I need it to be centered up. And so I have my calipers, I did the math again, you know, I took the total width of the bottom bracket shell, then the total width across here, I sub, you know, so I subtracted this from that and I divided by two. That gives me the distance I want on either side of the shell. And I just kind of com eyeball and compare side to side. Try and look straight on so I don't have a whole lot of parallax error. And uh, I'm going to call that good and uh, light her up. So right away when I lit up on this, I blew a little keyhole 
And so I filled that in already. This is, I don't think this is as difficult to manage as some of the other tubing. I just, uh, I didn't go about it with that much care, so I created a hole, but then I filled it up again without a whole lot of struggle because it's just not as thin and as touchy as some of the other tubing. So as I did those tacks on this side, as is usual with welding and tacking, the weld is sort of pinching, and so it pinches on the top side, and now this guy springs away from the little surface that it was registered on, and now there's a big gap on the bottom. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna just fill in that big gap. Uh, I wanna kinda put it back in position, and then I wanna weld it. So I got a C-clamp here to just assist me, an extra set of hands. Just kinda clamp that down gently, and it closes off that gap more or less. So now that we have the yoke tacked with four heavy tacks, it's in place, and now I set in the tubes that you saw me miter in the last video, and uh, I just, you know, did some final cleanup on those, and I touched the one with a file to get it sit just a little bit nicer, but basically, with the rubber band here, they hold themselves in place. This plate is not in play anymore. I'm just gonna keep it here uh, when I go to weld until it gets in the way. I might perch my hand on it or something, but anyway. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. If you look at the projection of this tube, it seems to match pretty well with the angle of this boss, you know? You look here, and that doesn't seem to be the case. The tube comes in and it looks a little bit shifted, but what's funny is that if I flip these tubes, which are essentially identical, if I flip them, uh, it looks the same here. And so that seems to suggest that like the rear end is out of square, which it's not that far out of square. I don't really know what's going on here. And uh, I've done some sniffing around. I'm not, I'm not really sure why that looks funny. Uh, as long as everything is where it should be, it doesn't really matter what that looks like. But uh, something is a little bit wrong and I'm not sure what it is. And uh, famous last words, but I'm just gonna charge on. Uh, in the words of Glenn Fry, the heat is on. Like I've said at some other points, uh, I tend to prefer the pulse for any actual weld out, to have the, the pulse of amperage controlled by the machine, and I tend to prefer straight current for tacking. Sometimes I just forget to turn the pulser off for tacking, but uh, it really starts helps with the arc starts. The arc isn't like bzzz, trying to get established. Uh, it just kind of lights up and it's smooth current and you can kind of get in there and get a, a little bit of attack established, I think a little bit more easily, at least with my welder. So, you know, I'm incredibly aware this is meaty, it's heavy, it's thick, and the heat can dissipate around the, you know, this is sort of a tube. The heat can go around it this way and it can go around this way. You can dump a lot of heat into this dropout and this tube is thin and it's coming to an end and it's a point and the heat that goes into this just very quickly brings it up to temperature to the point where it wants to melt away. I'm aware of that. My torch angle is pointed mostly toward the dropout and yet you can see here, it just melted away a little bit. There was a keyhole going on and I filled it in. Uh, it's, it's real easy to burn holes with this sort of thickness differential. You gotta be real careful. So this is the homemade frame fixture I built a couple years ago. There's some videos on this channel about this, uh, how I designed it and built it and, and what it is. And uh, I think, like I said in those videos, one of the measures of whether or not the frame fixture is really good and uh, you can enjoy using it is not only does it hold the stuff, do you have welding access, how easily does the stuff come out of the fixture? Sometimes you build it in there and then uh, some fixtures will have like a like a steel rod that runs through the head tube and that's a whole contraption and some of them, you know, it's just a production to try and get it out of there. And you might be putting it back in and out a bunch of times depending on how you build. Uh, I'm gonna do the weld out and some alignment checks out of the fixture and so uh, I need to remove it. Now because the front end isn't long enough, that's not gonna get in my way. But, um, you know, this is the test, sort of. I'm not saying this is a great fixture, 
Uh, it's not for sale, it's just something I built, but I think it's a good measure. So that came out pretty easily. Uh, if the if the head tube parts were on there, I would have had to if they were tight on there, I would have had to lift this up, and I would have had to would have been a little bit more cumbersome. So I want to do some alignment checks. You know, these are tacks, and they're good and heavy tacks, but I could break them and I could move stuff if I needed to. So uh, everything in the rear end looks pretty good, and I just want to check it before I move on. This here is a little bit interesting to me or maybe concerning. I just want to do some inspection with the tools that I have to ensure that it's actually square and see if I can understand why. Because it doesn't matter functionally if they look like they're coming in at the same angle, but that's sort of like a, that's a tell, that's a sign to me that maybe I got something wrong. The rear end isn't actually aligned. And so uh, I'm going about that. This is a tool that I built a couple years ago. It's not perfect check yourself. It's a rear end check tool. And so uh, I don't, what you could do is you could make a bunch of these discs in different diameters and screw them on here. And if this was square, you could slide it to whatever you wanted. And then this would act as like a dummy tire, or you could actually have it even bigger than the tire you're going to use. And then it would pretty much contact here and you could make sure that there was no gap on one side greater than on the other side. And since I don't feel like making another disc right now, I'm just measuring uh, you know, as, as good as I can by eye, sort of the distance between the inside face of this and the disc. I made a note to myself at one point that it was 16 thousandths off center. That's, that's pretty small. Uh, you know, with eyeballing, you're not even going to get that close. But um, I'm reading like 19 millimeters, and then I come over here, and I was also reading like 19 millimeters. So I felt like, uh, it, you know, it was, it was reasonably close. That wouldn't account for this much angle that I'm seeing uh, being like, you know, a fraction of a millimeter off. So I don't think that's my issue that it's it's off center here. Uh, it's possible that the, the whole rear end, like the dummy axle is shifted off to one side. And if it was shifted off to one side and one chain stay was longer than the other, then this would still be sitting sort of in the middle. It would look like it was in the middle, uh, but, but the whole rear end would be out. And that would maybe explain this. And so, from Park Tool Company, you can buy the frame alignment gauge. And it, it's funny how the, the, the long forward geometry, long front end mountain bike, it just doesn't, it like breaks the mold of, of what normally works for a lot of tools. And so if you put this on here, you're supposed to be able to kind of slap it against a head tube and a seat tube, and then it projects this adjustable finger out toward the rear of the frame, and you can kind of sweep that against your dropouts and then that'll let you know if your frame you know you do that and then you flip it over and you do the same check on the other side and you can compare and you can see if they're actually symmetrical well uh it's it's not even long enough right so the way this sits on the head tube uh you can just kind of barely get the corner of it on the head tube and then you know this here is already uh past the point of tangency you're into the bend which is really not how you want to use the tool and then you look at the little finger and it doesn't even reach the dropouts. So, I mean, this tool just doesn't really work for this application, which is fine. Uh, I, I'll find another way to check it, but it's just interesting to me how, like, you know, the frame big building fixture that I uh, designed is way too short. This is like fairly too short. And, uh, and there's other things. It's not only these, there's, there's you know, the tubes, uh, these are, you know, newly available from Nova Cycle, but like you used to not be able to get butted tubes that were nearly long enough. Uh, you know, this is just like a big departure from where uh, bicycle design used to be. And so a lot of the tools and the tubes and stuff just don't fit anymore. And I think if you were going to go and buy a frame building fixture today, you'd want to be real careful if you were going to make mountain bikes, some of them, you know, maybe more progressive uh, uh, forward geometry or something. You would want to make sure your fixture could extend that far. So I got this rigged up. It's not the best way to do this, but it's going to be good enough for what we're doing today. Uh, it's the same principle as the Park Tool Frame Alignment Gauge, but a little bit different orientation. So uh, I have the head tube, you know, the, the sort of parallel outside faces of the head tube will be my references here. So it's sitting on a one, two, three block. These are just to keep it compressed. Uh, so I gotta not bump those off. And then I have it sitting on this other piece. And what that does is it projects this part of the frame a certain distance above the table. The distance here is established by the relationship of these two points. And so I can use this thing called the surface gauge, height gauge, 
and this is really old school, and I just kind of sweep it. You can hear it scratch. There's a fine adjust knob right here. So not scratching, and I lower it. Not scratching. You can get really, you know, like within a thousandth or, you know, a pretty, pretty subtle distance. You know, I don't know exactly the number that you would be able to, to put to that, but if you're careful, you can get pretty sensitive measurements. I'm also, while it's set up like this, I'm gonna measure up here to see how far this is projecting off of the table. Right? So, so this is for the yoke and that one's for the dropout. Now, I just flip the orientation, I flip, I flip the setup over and I can take the same measurements, I can compare and contrast. It's, uh, it's kind of ridiculous, but okay. I take a measurement here. I mean, that's pretty dang close. That's, uh, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but I would say I was, you know, within about a millimeter, probably less than a millimeter, maybe 20 or 30 thousandths of an inch or half or, you know, 0.7 of a millimeter, somewhere in there. It's just eyeballing. And if I look down here, this is a bigger gap. This one is more like five thousandths of an inch or five millimeters. Let me measure that. This one is one, two, three millimeters. I'm calling that three millimeters. And so that lets me know that the, the rear wheel is sitting, you know, toward the non-drive side. And so I'll, I'm not really that worried about that. I'm just gonna use weld sequence to weld on this side of the frame first. It'll pull this, uh, this direction on the chain stays and stuff. As for the, the sort of uh, weird looking joint here, I'm not sure what that's about. Not really sure how to account for that. That, that, I don't know. A setup like this is a way to give you an idea of where you're at with, you know, respect to alignment and stuff. So if you're, uh, if you're some sort of, you know, mechanical technology, you know, if you're some sort of engineer or machinist or whatever, you gotta figure out uh, weird setups and stuff like this all the time to get things made and to, to inspect things. But, uh, you know, if you're making bike frames on a regular basis, they're all basically the same as each other with slight changes. Uh, you need, I, my way of thinking is you need tools that allow you to get that stuff done quickly. You can spend 20 minutes setting this up or an hour or something. And if you just have the right tools, the same steps might take you a minute or less. And when you start stacking that up over time, uh, it becomes kind of absurd how much you're losing to, to these little checks and stuff. So, so I'm just doing a, what's called a dry run here. You know, I kind of set everything in place and then I pretend like I'm welding and uh, I make sure that uh, it's pretty easy in a tight spot to start going and then your, your cup bangs into something or whatever, you can't see around a corner. And if you just practice doing the motion of putting the torch where it needs to go, you can ensure that you have the clearance and the and the comfort to get you know to make your pass. So I'm gonna go from this. I'm gonna light up on this tack right here, and I'm gonna do a pass at least to the middle, if not probably to the middle or something. It's interesting when you're when you're welding bikes, everything has a curve to it usually, and so you never get a straight section. Right here, I mean, this is like the only straight section I've ever welded on a bike anywhere, and it's just, the bead spacing is perfect. You know, for this little stretch, it's incredibly consistent as far as I'm used to. Here, we got into, uh, on the inside of this, I think there's a little bit more material on the inside of this piece, and then I came across this other weld puddle, and I think my cup kind of, it's getting closer to some other stuff. My arc link got longer. So here it gets a little bit less consistent, but through here it just looks exactly the same dime after dime for a while. That's kind of interesting. You just don't get that on a bike much. You're always changing your torch angle and wrapping around things. You know, it's hot as balls in the shop today. I'm physically uncomfortable from the heat, but I gotta say, welding bike frames is one of my very favorite things to do, and it does get me excited to be uh, laying the beads and striking the arc. I'm getting spoiled on these smooth straight stitches, now I gotta wrap around something again. 
I'll try and get like a third or half of the way around this and then uh, stitch it up in another pass or two. So this should be the last stitch of the perimeter of the yoke to bottom bracket interface. So I'll do that one and then, uh, then I'll move on. I think I'll do these bosses and then I think I'll finish up here at the dropouts. I tell you, if I just did this all day every day, I'd be so good at this. Uh, I would love that, but that's not my life. It's, uh, it's exciting, always, every new step of the, of the project, and I'm just, you know, I pulled this out of the picture, I wasn't even thinking about it that much, but yeah, this is my frickin' bike, it's coming together, that's exciting. I was just thinking about how when I'm riding this in the woods, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a little mud shelf right here. This is gonna be, this is the cleanest this will ever be, right? <laughs> it's gonna be collecting a little mud shelf right there, and uh, I don't know, it gets me kind of excited about the, the fun I'm gonna have riding this thing around. As you get into smaller tubes, uh, you need to wrap your angle of your torch in like shorter distances, and it becomes, and that also here, there's like a thickness differential, thicker piece and thinner piece, and uh, same is true up here. Uh, as you get into those tighter things, it becomes harder to make a smooth looking bead. You can imagine if you were welding really big pipe, your torch angle would change so slowly you would almost be welding in a straight line, relatively speaking. And so, uh, you know, the, the small ones really become difficult aesthetically, but also just not burning holes and getting a good weld. And so, you know, it's a challenge for me. I gotta do the best I can here uh, as I'm welding around here. You know, this is different than the joints on a bike typically are. Typically, you know, tubing joints, like main tube joints, uh, it's one tube crashing into another tube. So, you know, kind of like this. And you have an angle between the tubes, and even in the relative dark with the hood down and, you know, the, the shadows and all that stuff, you can still pretty t clearly tell where you're trying to weld. And here, it's basically, it's like a tube that meets up with something that's made to look like a tube of the same diameter and there's a small little um, you know crack between them and uh, it's it's easy enough to actually lose track of where your line is as long as you have filler in there now I don't know maybe I should just be fuse fusing these together and not adding any filler uh, that would maybe help with being able to see what I'm doing but it's just a little bit different than what I'm used to and so you know it takes getting it takes me getting some use getting used to it a little bit uh, it's gonna take me getting used to it a little bit. It is a very hot day in the shop, but I finished these bosses here and um, these are hard to weld. They're hard for me to weld. I'm not used to welding them. There's a thickness differential. The hardest part probably is that it's a tight, uh, it's a it's a smaller diameter, and so you know, with every pulse of the weld, you got to really change your angle a lot. But for me, and probably for a lot of amateur welders, it's a lot easier to just kind of keep your torch angle the same and kind of move, and uh, and so rapidly your torch angle is wrong, and then. Uh, you know, if you, your electro distance is also, I was finding it a little bit harder to keep consistent. And so when you get a little bit further away and your torch angle's wrong, it kind of starts shooting these big like flares. It like heats up the gases around and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's fine. This should be structurally sound, I think, but it's just not my best work. And um, you know, you just have to practice this sort of thing if you wanted to get better at it. I don't have a whole lot to say about this, but you know, I'm just gonna be welding the dropout to the chain stays, and there's a big thickness differential, like I said earlier, and so I just need to be real careful to dump most of my heat into the dropout and just enough into the tube as I'm welding around. It's probably gonna be hard to make them look super pretty because of that, you know, again, that sort of quick rate at which you need to reposition and, and change your angle, but I'm gonna do my best. Also of note here is that, um, this isn't as tight as it could be, but you know, the, the tube is a little bit close to the outside face of the dropout. And then down on the bottom, it's kind of close 
uh, maybe closer even than it ought to be, but it's kind of close to the inside face also. There's kind of a step down and down here it's closer. But anyway, I just need to be aware, you know, in the middle section of the uh, the dropout is one thing, but as you get toward the outside then, if you're going to maintain a nice square outside corner and not burn that away, but also get the right size weld fillet that you need, you know, it can be tricky. And so, uh, you know, I got to manage sort of the bead profile and the heat and all these things as I'm moving around. And uh, it's, you know, this isn't super thin tubes, so I don't think it'll be too difficult, but you know, there, there are tricky things about this and I'm just going to tear into it. I hate to jinx myself, but it's uh, it's going pretty good so far. This is the last stitch of the chain stays unless I'm missing something. It's a pretty awkward position, but I actually think I have decent control here. Nah, too weird. <laughs> Couldn't make it happen. It's really, this, this part repair stand is so much better than nothing. It's so versatile and you can really get the bike frame in a lot of positions and yet it's still very limited. This clamp can really get in your way. Uh, if you have different size mainframe tubes, which you pretty much always do, then you're always adjusting this to get it to grab different size tubes. Uh, this damn mechanism, the rotation lock, which is good to have, of course, you want rotation, but it's, it's just real finicky, so by the time you get it loose, then it's really loose. Uh, it doesn't get nearly low enough. I actually took a hacksaw and I chopped like four inches out of this stand and then I had to chop four inches out of the this part of it that slides in there and it's always when I'm welding bikes it's always at the lowest position and yet it's still way too high oftentimes and I actually at one point I had a welding bench that had instead of this base here it had a different clamp mechanism that would clamp this this top section and so, you know, this is really good. It's a lot better than nothing, but you could improve on this vastly if you're welding bikes day in and day out, you would want, and you probably need something better. This plastic stuff here can melt if you get it too close to hot stuff. It doesn't ground through the clamp, so you have to clip the ground on. So ideally you would have it grip with something that was like copper, that's heat uh, stable and conductive, and then your ground would go on here. There's all sorts of improvements to be made, but it's a lot better than nothing. I'll take it. So this should be the last stitch. Oh, it's pretty easy, actually. Okay, so it's a hot day. It's very hot, I'm so sweaty. But we got the rear end, it's on here, it's welded. So we welded the bottom bracket shell to the yoke, the yoke to the chain stays. And, uh, and then up here, we have the chain stays to the dropouts. Now, this stretch of weld is looking pretty nice. This stuff here, it's fine, whatever. Take it or leave it. This stuff, it's fine, it's okay, it's not the best. One of the things I didn't point out is that uh, with these tubes here, their diameter is relatively large, and then the width of these dropouts is not super wide. And so where they land, there's only enough room to just get a little bit of a weld fillet on the inside and on the outside without a lot of extra margin. So if they're biased a little bit too far to one side or to the other side, you're kind of screwed. And I did pretty good on lining these up, but you'll see down here on the bottom, still kind of warm, uh, right there where the weld fillet kind of passes by that corner, uh, kind of roast in the corner a little bit there. Same on the other side, maybe even worse. It'll be fine. Uh, that's enough clearance. I think the weld is strong enough. It's fine. Ideally though, uh, I would have welded that a little bit nicer and I would have left myself a little more room to weld it. No big squeal. It's gonna be fine. 
Uh, next steps, we gotta lay out and design how we wanna do the seat stays, where we're gonna put the bends to you know wrap around the tire, and then we gotta cut tubes, bend tubes, miter them, fit them up, and uh, prep them and, and weld them. So, uh, on guard! Defend yourself, Clem.